and I make cakey, creamy, foodie inspired ceramics. Um, so in order to sort of show you where I'm at now, I thought I'd go back a few years and look at some of my older work. Um, and it's great when you're looking back at these things because you can sort of assign reasons that you did them. Uh, <laughs> whereas at the time it's all a jumble, it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Um, so this is work that I made in 2014. Um, I started <laughs> to look into uh, packaging, advertising. Actually, the project was value. Um, so I looked into value foods, you know, Tesco value, Sainsbury Spark Price. Um, <coughs> nice to smell friends. And uh, during my research, I found that these foods are actually often uh, designed badly uh, as a method of upselling. And obviously, this was just like a humorous piece to uh, highlight that. But you can see it's kind of crude, just starting to get into ceramics, uh, just sort of playing around really. Uh, moving swiftly on, in my second year, I was lucky enough to uh, go on an exchange trip to Nagoya, Japan, at the art university there, and that's really informed my work at the time and you know, ever since really. Incredible opportunity, but I won't go into that now. Uh, <laughs> but what I really enjoyed was the supermarkets. I would just wander the supermarkets daily, you know, looking at all the interesting colours, the shapes, the typography, iconography, and, uh, you know, you really see the differences and the similarities um, in something as simple as, you know, shop or products. And so, as, at the end of this four-month exchange, um, we were invited to exhibit our work, and um, I'm just going to show you the body of work which I made. Um, so the work is called Supa, which is uh, Japanese for supermarket. And I chose objects which I felt reflected something about Japanese culture, um, but through supermarket foods. Um, so you can see in the bottom there, slightly cut off, um, this is a brand of coffee called Boss Coffee. Um, and I thought this was quite an interesting kind of artifact um, in terms of aspiration, because it's this figure, this mustachioed man, with holding a pipe, silhouetted. And it's sort of, you know, if you drink Boss Coffee, you can be the boss. Um, and the Japanese are huge drinkers of coffee as well. Um, I think I remember reading in the 80s, in the one year in the 80s, they were almost, um, they were almost, they always made up 15% of the world's imports of oh, oh, coffee, so they were importing that much, there was such demand. Uh, and they also invented the canned coffee. Um, if any of you are familiar with it, it's a bit of a weird one, because um, it comes out hot or cold from vending machines. It's a bit of a amalgam of sugar, milk, and coffee. Um, this piece on the left is uh, coffee cartons, or uh, tea cartons. And because in Japan, um, it's quite usual in the cold aisle to see uh, pre-mixed tea or coffee. So that's tea with milk and sugar put in it, served cold, uh, which to like an English person is just really nasty. Um, <laughs> and they're always called things like royal milk, beauty, and this kind of queenly connotation, so I thought they were an interesting object. Um, on the top there, it's azuki ice creams. Um, azuki is bean paste, so it's bean paste flavoured ice creams, which are quite nice and sweet, but it, I can get over the bean thing. Um, but that's a flavour the Japanese really enjoy, um, so I decided to make those. And then you can see the giant orange, which I chose to display in the supermarket trolley. Um, if on the previous slide, um, you see that uh, oranges and apples are often packaged in this sort of puffy plastic wrap. And even though it's not great environmentally, um, obviously, there was something quite sweet about it that I really enjoyed. Um, the idea that they're sort of cared for and so carefully kind of preserved for you, and that was reflected in the way like the cashiers handled your food. They were very, really, you know, gently putting your stuff down in a basket, and it was just to reflect that kind of care in nature. So that's why I made these pieces. Um, so moving on to my third year at university, um, got back to England, and I wanted to do a really hard-hitting kind of project about advertising and how advertising is really bad, and you know they shouldn't be able to do, you know, to advertise to us. Um, so I went on like a 10 minute walk around the city and was able to take maybe 100, 150 photos of, um, of advertising, which is quite bad if you think about it. Um, so I did some more research around the topic, but I found myself always going back to these images of food in advertising. There's just something about them that really drew me to them. Uh, perhaps it's the perfection. Uh, we've all heard 
heard anecdotally, you know, they use glue in cereal commercials to get that, you know, lovely milky texture and uh, sometimes ice cream in adverts is made of mashed potatoes because ice cream would melt. Um, and just sort of started looking all around that kind of cultural kind of zeitgeist because I think food could be a really good reflection of the culture at the time. Um, and also the whole Instagram thing has just started to kick off. I think this was 2014, 2015. So people were always taking photos of their food and it was just becoming a big thing kind of culturally and visually. Um, so this is the collection of work which I produced um, after that research. I'm going through this quite quickly because I'm going to show you a video in a minute. Um, but this collection is called Half Baked, which is sort of a pun, play on words, and quite appropriate because I didn't really know what I was doing for half the year. <laughs> um, but again, um, I, uh, as I did in Japan, I sort of looked into objects which conveyed some kind of cultural meaning, some kind of barometer, something like that. Um, so macarons really stood out to me as um, an aspiration of food, which seems bizarre because everybody needs to eat, everybody needs to eat, so why should it uh, be an aspirational thing? But you know, if you went out for macarons and a cup of coffee, you'd take a photo of it, no doubt. Um, <laughs> um, and I actually went to, um, visited a real patisserie um, as a form of research quite early in the morning and watched how they make macarons. And that actually really informed the process of making them in ceramics, which you wouldn't think it would transfer, but it really does. Um, and then you can see cookies and cakes and kind of sweet things. I was just sort of drawn to that, I suppose. And the croquant bouche on the right, which um, is a French wedding cake, or often used as a wedding cake in France. Um, and that was um, a sort of response to how can I make the biggest, kind of most impressive thing within this kind of sweet parameters. Um, yes, yeah, so that's the half day collection. And this is my fourth year work. Um, where I loved what I did in the third year, but I was sort of done with realism and I wanted to sort of step away from that and people started to call me the cookie lady or the macaron lady, so I just sort of wanted to come back from that just a little bit. Um, uh, but this collection was just meant to, because I sort of, I won't say mastered, but I was quite comfortable with a lot of the techniques I was using, so this year I was really able to kind of push it and play with it. Um, and this is where I'm at at the moment with my work. Um, so you can see the melt mugs up there were a sort of way of translating uh, quite tactile glazes into like a kind of fun practical object. Um, these lemon meringue vessels, again, sort of, they're not meant to be an exact lemon meringue, but they're like a reflection of the lemon meringue with the gold luster. And, uh, and these pieces on the left, I call aftermath vessels, but I think I'm gonna change that name actually. Um, that was sort of because they're sort of something's happened, there's an activity that's gone on, they're really fun to make, so you're seeing the aftermath of them. Um, and there's another shot, and that actually got some examples down there afterward. Um, so this slide is all about the future and about my inspirations at the moment. Because um, when you're in a university environment, you're the research has to be a little more serious and a little more book-led and a little less Instagram-led. Uh, but now I'm really enjoying just sort of finding inspiration in anything. I'm going back to sort of Japanese icons, uh, I've sort of started to draw faces on everything and I can't really stop. Because uh, <laughs> um, it's just so prevalent and I really enjoy it. Um, so this is what the future looks like for me. Um, and I'm now going to show you a short, a five minute video, um, which goes, which sort of shows my process. And it's silent, so I can just sort of talk over it. Um, so I designed this video to be a sort of, not a parody, but um, I'm sure you've all seen GIF recipes or, um, I'm not sure the other word for them, but you see them on Facebook and it's where somebody goes like, Oh, onions, meat, potatoes, and then you get this lovely tagine at the end of it. Um, so I tried to sort of replicate that with this video. Um, but I think where it fails is the length, because the videos online are normally about 30 seconds, and that's about as much time as your brain has to uh, has its attention span. But this is obviously it's a lot longer process, so the video came out a lot longer. But yeah, 
I work at porcelain as well, um, and I'm glad I made the switch actually because it's such a wonderful material to work with. Um, tricky at first, but really worth the effort. Sorry, I like this bit. <laughs> <laughs> Just gonna wait, I'll talk in a minute. And actually, like, I cut this up and put a bit on Facebook, and this bit you're, or Instagram, and this bit that you're about to see got over 2,000 views. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. People stop me in the street all the time. <laughs> it produces this spiral aesthetic. <laughs> um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about um, research as well, because it's something that at university, um, obviously they mark you against it, so there's a big emphasis on doing the right kind of research and also presenting your research in a positive way, and also like a quick and easy way, because when tutors are marking, you know, they don't have a whole lot of time, they just, you know, they want to be able to absorb it and understand what you've done, and sort of quite simply. So the video is one way that I've tried to do that, um, and I just had this running uh, during the degree show. Um, and another way is that, uh, so in my third year, which was the uh, croquant bouche macaron cookie year, um, I, to hark back to some of the uh, advertising and kind of uh, consumerist ideas that I was playing with at the start of the project, um, I made a mini magazine and called it Consume Magazine, which is a bit on the head, but, um, <laughs> but, and, oh yeah, with that magazine I sort of tried to parody um, that kind of culture, so I had sort of funny headlines like, uh, 10 things you're doing wrong with kale, and uh, stuff like that, um, but then inside the magazine was actually you know, quite serious research, or the content was um, the research that I've been doing that year. Um, and then in my fourth year, uh, with this project, um, the project was loosely titled On Food and Ceramics, which is a bit of a play on words um, of Harold McGee's uh, book on food and cooking. Um, so I produced this book, which you can see down here, uh, as an accompaniment to the project, and in that, uh, I go through, sort of in the style of a recipe, um, so I go through how each of these pieces are made, because um, it was a bit of a, there were just five pieces that I focused on, and so I could go through the whole process, and you could just see it laid out in front of you there. So in theory, that book contains the whole year's research, um, so I'm really glad that I made it actually, and I think the tutors appreciated having that as a quick kind of uh, method. And actually, post-uni, it's quite hard to, because there's nobody there bullwhipping you into doing research, it's quite hard to find the time, effort, energy to do, sort of, to get kind of deep into it. Um, but it's definitely something, it's definitely worth doing, and every time that I've, you know, taken the time to do an interview, or, you know, go and visit somebody, or, you know, sort of push the, push the boat out in terms of research, it's paid off in spades. So, um, that's something I definitely want to continue doing. My maker's mark, a lowercase a, Alice. Uh, while this is going, I'll talk really briefly about um, the sort of future um, and where. Oh, it's over. Well, <laughs> um, so I'm currently. Um, uh, my day job is as a PR assistant for. Uh, yummy. For designer makers, um, so I'll just say really briefly that it's really helped me um, position myself and know more broadly about the industry and um, to sort of refine everything that I'm doing in the right way to kind of step out into the world and say, hey, I'm a ceramic artist, um, if that makes sense. <coughs>
So um, the kind of work that I'm most interested in is functional pieces. I'm really interested in kind of sharp and angular forms. And um, so I kind of like the challenge of trying to create these in clay, kind of like Anna said about working with porcelain. I work with porcelain as well, so I'm always trying to kind of, yeah, just make it do what I want, really. <laughs> um, I'm often influenced by architecture. Um, so here's some kind of process photos. So I do slip cast and mold making. Um, so this is kind of at the university when we have a lathe. This is that. And, um, um, yeah, so I like mold making because it kind of allows me to create the sharp and rigid forms that I'm most interested in. Um, the latest collection that I made at university in my fourth year was called Atro City, so it's kind of a play on words. Um, it's based on Greek-Swiss architecture, and I was kind of looking at the recent revival of it, and so kind of when it emerged, people really liked it, and then kind of in the 80s, everybody thought it was kind of monstrous and horrible and it's big, heavy, concrete things, but suddenly everyone's really interested in it, so I kind of I did a dissertation on this revival, and I called it Atro City because it's kind of like it used to be atrocious, but now it's this new thing. Yeah, so here's kind of some photos of my inspirations. Um, I take all my photos on my film camera. Um, so I was kind of also, I was looking at the actual physical appearance of the buildings and kind of the heavy asymmetric proportions. But I was also looking into the kind of design philosophies behind the architecture. So I kind of got form follows function as one of the main things behind it. And for this I looked at Robin Hooper's Robin Hopper's functional pottery book and in this he kind of outlines things that that make pottery function better, so kind of where the handle should sit, how the spout should sit, um, kind of angles and all this kind of thing. So this was kind of informing the shapes for my pieces as well as the Briggs's architecture. And I was also looking at truth to materials, so all of the pieces, the porcelain, I wanted to really speak for itself. So any of the coloured pieces that's coloured all the way through the body of the clay, um, rather than kind of having a coloured glaze which sits on top and covers it up. Um, and there's unglazed sections so people can kind of touch it and feel the tactile nature of the pieces and kind of natural porcelain and how it's kind of refined. Um, I chose to use porcelain to kind of show the revival as well to show that it's kind of new and fresh and that it's not this kind of heavy grey thing that people used to think it was. So I was kind of looking into simplifying the designs as much as possible. So this is a sugar container. Um, I've, because of the way everything sits, it all stacks up together. So a lot of people always think it's a coffee pour over. So I'm kind of looking into developing this into a coffee pour over as well now. And I picked beach because it's kind of food safe qualities people kind of understand it's used in the kitchen and with beach utensils kind of thing and also because it was kind of simple and plain like the porcelain I wanted it to just be yeah kind of reflect each other. So um, I picked a tea set because a teapot's technically challenging and because there were so many requirements for a tea teapot from Robin Hopper's book, I thought, yeah, the tea set. And also, I kind of like the idea of the kind of contrast of brutalism and a tea set, and kind of people usually thinking of kind of really fine, elegant, traditional tea set with tiny bone china mugs and things. And I thought I'd go for kind of the opposite, really, with the heavy, but still kind of sculptural. Um, 
and so I've kind of got the tree to materials as well here with the teacup. So I'm going to do all the joining of the ceramic and the wood to be kind of evident. That's why I've got the, the rivets on show, and there's no glue or anything, so it's all quite it's all obvious, and you can see it all from just looking at it. Um, so this is kind of since university I've been kind of trying to develop this range, um, take it into new directions. So this is a similar style cup but with a ceramic handle to kind of make it a bit a bit easier to make really since finishing at the moment I go home to do all the wooden bits and because my dad has the tools that I need so I kind of do all the ceramic here in Phoenix and then go home for the wooden bits. Um, So since university, I was selected as one of six winners for the Homi Maker Design Award, and that's aimed at designers aged under 35, um, and the prize included free participation in the Homi Trade Fair, which is kind of like a lifestyles, yeah, lifestyle trade fair. Um, so it was really interesting seeing how an international audience reacted to my work, and kind of, they liked the tea set, but obviously tea set's not the same in Italy. It's not got the same kind of, yeah, not what we used to associate with it really. So yeah, the real thought it was like a coffee pour. They were like, oh, I'm really interested. And then and it was like, oh, it's just a shipping container. They were like, oh, okay. So it's really just interesting to see how it worked. And there were like a few Americans there and they were like, oh yeah, a tea set. Oh yeah, I'm like really interested in it. So it's kind of just, yeah, really got me thinking of how to bring it into different places. Um, I've also taken part in the Hot House program, which is run by the Crafts Council. So this is a professional development program and it runs across the country and there's kind of different cohorts of about 12, 10 to 12 people <coughs> in each one. Um, it's in its seventh year and hopefully by the end we should be able to run a sustainable craft business and it's kind of helped me to figure out the direction of my career and yeah to kind of make, help me keep doing ceramics really as an actual career. Um, so my future plans, this is the new range that I'm developing, it's called Habitual. And um, so it's just kind of a similar style to Atrio City, but kind of really simple, clean designs, um, glazed and unglazed sections coloured all the way through. Um, and this is kind of using feedback that I got from Homi as well, because lots of people are like, oh, if you had plates, then I'd be really interested, but not, yeah, not too much from this. So, but I did, I did get good feedback from that as well. So yeah, hopefully these should be ready for the open studio. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I'll, I'll probably mainly be speaking to you about my research uh, ideas and, and some processes tonight and, and maybe some um, sort of influences uh, that I've had along the way um, um, and probably more about a sort of recent body of work which I've sort of titled um, Non-Places, Non-Objects. Um, so, the majority of my work is informed through my own photography. Um, I'm, sort of, I'm interested in, I don't know, maybe being on my own and uh, being in isolation and going to places that are abandoned and uh, not, I don't like, not. Uh, psychologically, I don't think I like to be on my own, but like, uh, sort of physically, maybe, I don't know. Um, <laughs> uh, so I go to sort of various places and I generally go quite early in the morning to sort of avoid meeting other people while I'm out. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know why. Um, but with the photography, I, I sort of try to capture that idea of um, maybe loneliness or desertion, um, uh, so that I can have the photography and then try to relay that, I suppose, through my uh, ceramic work. 
Um, yeah, I'm mean, sort of interested in things that no longer function, or you know, you've got an idea of what maybe went on with them, but not necessarily. I don't know. Maybe you know, sort of slightly nondescript, I suppose, in a way. And, uh, but you get an idea of what they sort of used to be. So I kind of, you know, these are the kind of pictures that I enjoy taking. It's just, um, <laughs> so, I also enjoy architecture, um, so I love looking at like a lot of constructivist architecture um, and modernist stuff, but I, the, the, the kind of repetitive, these repetitive forms, they, they, they really kind of interest me and I, 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 you know, you'll see through my ceramic work that I like repetition. I, uh, you know, I do. This, this, there's something I, I, I started to work with concrete a little bit, and there's there's something about primary colours and concrete architecture that really interests me. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I love the contrast between it, um, and obviously there's very really famous. Um, this is unit dehabitation in Marseille uh, by Le, Le Corbusier, um, which is an extremely famous building. Um, but there's also, I found these really sort of like interesting forms and I, they're, they're, they're so over-constructive. I mean, that's a bus stop, it's ridiculous. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I love that. It's, it's, it's a wonderful thing. But, you know, and the, there's something beautiful about that form, of, and it's a diving board, and it's completely made of concrete. Um, where am I? But I think, yeah, I mean, I, I, in a way that, you know, the, the, the sense of that, it does portray power, you know, and that was a very you know, it's very, uh, the Russians really wanted to make things that, that really portrayed that with, with reliance and, um, and so that, you know, that's what they, they built, but, and I, I, but I love them simple minimalist forms. Uh, but and I, I think that they've also got like, you know, some sort of, there, there is humour in there somewhere. And it's just, very interesting. Um, so I'm sort of, sort of similar to Emma. I'm, I'm, I'm quite interested in uh, sort of post-war uh, British architecture as well. You know, particularly when there weren't many materials around to build with after the war, and bricks were really short. So like you know, a lot of uh, buildings, tower blocks, got built with with concrete because it was a cheap, versatile material um, and and they have, I mean historically they have been um, unloved by architectural groups, you know, that the, the people haven't liked them up until now really, and up until the last few years where they, you know, there has been certain preservation orders been put on some of these Buildings. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, most places have. Where am I? Sorry, I've just lost my uh, point. I, I mean, I, I use these buildings as starting points, and I, I like to. I'm just, I, I like to see a beauty in them, where you know there is there's a beauty inside that should be revealed, and I. I, I I, I use really simple collaging, with, uh, you know, techniques to to just cut out forms, look at shapes. I'm interested in them really flat shapes. Looking at them, can I repeat them uh, in, in in any sort of way? Um, so that's kind of where I start to move on from maybe my photography. Uh, I mean, some of these places, you know, they're really hostile, and you know, 
they, they've been they've been talked of as being hostile and uncommunicative, but I mean, really, you know, I'm sort of not averse to, to you know grandiosity of, of palaces and stately homes and and things like that. But I I, I, t I suppose I, I want to I want to celebrate places like this uh, rather than you know the, the beautiful places through my work, I suppose. Um, Yeah, so I'm very interested in these sort of repeat forms, very simple, again, really drawing very simple shapes and then trying to make something from them. Uh, so, yeah, I'm really interested in, in, as I said, going to these places on my own, early in the morning, um, and places that were, where I call them non-places, but I think architects, they're called the places in between, something like that, they call them. Um, and the places that aren't used, you know, but they, they are there for a function. I mean, that's holding up a, that's shore and flyover, or the underneath of it. Um, you know, and, and I suppose, that and you know some dreary car parks um, and, and stairwells. I, I sort of have this phobia about stairwells, probably stemming from I don't know shopping trips. In whoever comes from Brighton, you'll probably remember Churchill Square. It was a hideous place, and I used to go there with my parents, and they would take me down these stairs to the supermarket and. Yeah, just the urine stinking, you know, <laughs> hypodermic needle. It's horrible. But there was, um, there was sort of light at the end of the tunnel because when you used to come out, there used to be a beautiful, very brutalist <coughs> sort of what they call monolith uh, uh, structure, which was called the Spirit of Brighton. And it always used to brighten up my day, strangely. But um, yeah, no, it was. It's, yeah, I like I like these places. They have, you know, I I think these places have a sort of uncomfortable edge that um, you know you can feel isolated there. And I suppose it is sort of like a sort of I don't know a sort of Robinson Crusoe meets Chernobyl. I like that kind of idea. Um, you know, I, 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 I want to be isolated, but at the same time, maybe in an urban environment. So I know there's lots of people around. Um, okay, so through my work, I, I, I do, I kind of celebrate the unconventional and the uncomfortable beauty of concrete spaces uh, and defunct objects. Um, and the reason why I really like the idea of using the ceram ceramic is that it, I think it's got a fragility about it, and I suppose that relates back to the fragility of, of being isolated, feeling vulnerable, um, and so it, it works into that materiality of it all. Um, so I, I thought, I sort of quickly, I don't know, I wasn't quite sure how long this was going to last, I thought I'd just show you some of my sort of art and my artist's influences. So this is uh, Donald Judd, he's a, most of you probably would know, he's a minimalist, um, extremely famous, but I, you know, I really like the, this sort of concrete idea of repetitiveness and the, the, the sort of concrete structures, and very famous, uh, again, wall pieces that he makes. Uh, this is Brank, uh, Constantine Brancusi, his studio. Um, yeah, I mean, from my work, you can really see that. You know, he's uh, very interesting, and you know that sort of repetitive form, and you know, constantly trying that same form over and over again with slight changes to it. Uh, this is Victor Pass Passmore, uh, he's sort of like leader, sort of constructivist um, guy. He used to also make concrete pavilions, I suppose, but I'm really interested in these 3D objects that are in 
a, a, a space and you don't really know, you know, a space really it's sort of like, um, sort of, I don't know, sort of like uh, Kedinsky but in a three dimensional form. Uh, Frank Stella, very flat, but I, I, I really love the sort of action that he gets in his, in his paintings. Um, and also he does relief work as well. Uh, this is Heinz Mack, who I came across because I was just looking into things and it said stair enthusiast, and I really like stairs, so <laughs> I was interested in his stuff. Um, and you know, they're real, you know, real simple objects, some are made from stone, some are clay, some are, um, he does use concrete, and then, Sort of moving on to ceramic artists that I like. Um, there's uh, John Mason, who, you know, John Mason and Ken Price and um, what's he called? V Vulkos. He they they sort of changed the way dynamic. Uh, they they changed the way ceramics were seen really during the 50s and 60s. You know that they they moved from functional to gallery. Um, and yeah, you know, these forms are wonderful and they, you know, worked for years on these forms and getting them right. Um, this is Ken Price. Uh, again, you know, I, I just went up to his exhibition, he had a, a show up in London at Hauser and Worth recently, which was really good. Uh, so these are, it's just slightly out of focus. And this, I just thought, I'd, this is Cody Hoyt, who is uh, he's very contemporary. He's around at the moment. Uh, he's an American guy that works in a very interesting way because he, he uses a lot of coloured clay and he, he lays it up and then he cuts through it and then he slab builds these, you know, really interesting pots. Uh, so I quickly talk about my work processes. Uh, I start off with really basic sketches. I, I you know, I, I, I can kind of draw, but I'm not really interested in drawing. I, 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 I like to just think of something, get it down, and, and you know, and, and start moving on with it. Um, and I, I'm not too precious about these drawings, as you can see. But I was very pleased, actually, to see when I went to see Ken Price that his, he also, as much as he makes beautiful uh, prints. You know, when you look through his book of his sketches, they're very rough, they're very, you know, he draws in felt it pen and, you know, and it's all about, for me, it's just about getting ideas down. Uh, once I've sort of got an idea of what I want to make, I always make maquettes because, you know, they're small, you can mess around with them, you can manipulate cardboard, paper, foam board very easily. Um, and so, yeah, and, and you've got something physical in your hand and you can, you know, mess around with it. Maybe, you know, they're nice to draw from as well. And, you know, and then that's where your idea maybe might evolve. I then, once I'm satisfied with what I want to make, I will then, I, I use AutoCAD and I, I start to draw 3D models on the computer. Um, and you know, it's it's a it's a great tool. Some people argue against it, you know, but for me, it's a, it's a fantastic tool that I can look, change things very quickly if I want to. And then, sort of, once I'm happy, the the picture on the right. So the, so I make a basic model on the left. The base, then I make, I copy the model and then I slice it up. I, I and I I slice it. I work out what material I want to make the model in, whether it's 9mm ply or, you know, it might be 6mm MDF, it doesn't really matter, really, but I just slice it up in them, uh, in that, the, I mean, these are all scaled forms, so I know exactly what each piece is going to start to look at. So once they're sliced, I pull the whole model apart, I flatten it, and then I get most of my stuff laser cut. Um, I have made some of my own models. They, they take a long time and 
they're not accurate enough for what I want. So finally, I end up with these. And, and something that I've devised is, is a way of um, what I do is put a dowel all the way through the wooden, the, the central point of the um, model. And so this is exactly the same model, but I can make thousands of different uh, connotations of that of that one model by just twisting it around the dowel. So each individual piece I can twist. It's, it, I don't ever glue it, so uh, I have, you know, loads of opportunities to make different uh, moulds. So my making process as a ceramicist, um, I don't know if uh, how many of you know about slip cast and how you slip cast, but basically slip casting is a is a is a way of um, is, is a liquid clay and uh, basically you, you pour the liquid clay into a plaster mould that you've made. So this is the laser cut on the left a, a section. Uh, it takes a while to you know learn how to make the moulds and how you know stop your undercutting and all them kind of techniques. But you eventually learn how to make the moulds and. Um, so I, I, make, I make single, smaller pieces and then build them up. So, uh, yeah, so sorry, the, the slip is poured into the mould, uh, it's liquid. Uh, you generally leave it, you can leave it from between five minutes, 40 minutes. Um, you know, it's all tried and tested. You, you try and test until you get the right thickness that you want. And basically the water, um, the, the water, goes into the plaster and it leaves the cl a clay body uh, uh, on the edge of the plaster. Um, so then eventually you end up, so that's a hollow, that's a hollow um, uh, mould made of clay that I've got out of my uh, plaster mould. Um, and then obviously you know, back to what I was telling you about what I enjoyed, uh, so I, I really like the idea of repetition, so I start to make lots and lots. You can get lots, plenty out of moulds, you probably get between 50 and 80 casts out of a mould. Um, and so I start casting and then I start to join them and build up my clay work. I mean this, it, it starts, joining is quite a it's not necessarily a difficult thing, but when you start multiple join-ins, you know, you, you, you're, it's very likely that you're gonna get breakages along the way. Uh, and these are some construction ideas that I start to mess around with, just with the repetition and ideas of exactly the same mold. So finally, I just show you my work. Uh, so this is, uh, so, you know, I mean, this is based sort of on chore and flyover, I suppose, in a way, you know, standing underneath that huge thing that, you know, you're not overly happy with standing underneath it, but, um, so this is called Brute and Charisma. Uh, this is a, a stairwell piece. <coughs> Um, this is, uh, it, it seemed like it was coming out of the ground when I cast the concrete underneath it, so that's piercing excavation. Um, this is another, you know, very, this, this actually was a different technique. I did, I slabbed this one, but uh, I won't go into that now. And again, another slabbed blocks. Uh, again, that's, so then, that's the same repeated uh, form but just turned and twisted and that's the piece that I've got over there. Um, I like I I kinda like the idea of things being set in concrete, particularly the ceramic, because it kind of you know that kind of gives it a you, you can't really you're not allowed to move it and you you know you feel and maybe, maybe it's, it's that whole idea of being trapped um, in these desolate places, I suppose. Um, 
but that's him. <laughs> So um, I have a degree in graphic design, uh, went back to university, uh, studied with these guys, did a four-year course in, and some more guys here, yeah. and <laughs> um, did a four-year course in design and craft. Um, we now share a studio and we all do very different things, which is why we kind of work very well together. We have different skills, we all help each other out with different aspects of our work. Um, my final year project concerned hyperreal ceramics and the use of digital tooling and focuses on sort of generative process on the computer which are derived from sort of ideas of degeneration and I just wanted to continue sort of evolving the visual vocabulary that I've been developing. Um, it's impossible not to earn, I don't know why. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, I like to use the Oxford Dictionary's definition of degenerate as having lost the physical, mental, or moral qualities considered normal, lacking some usual or expected quality, in particular corrupt or decadent. And generative is defined as using rules to generate surface forms from underlying abstract forms. So these polarised concepts of generation versus degeneration inspire my MDES work to follow two streams of research. The first is with digital and the other is analogue, as depicted here with the sine wave, if you're familiar with audio processing. This is perhaps best explained by comparing physical with virtual. Both can be seen to exist and the other reflect each other. However, interaction with digital uh, requires a computer interface to interpret data and translate it for our sensory system. For the analog side of my work, I used a lot of uh, manual techniques, um, throwing and hand painted glaze. Um, the idea was to create permanent interpretations of temporal surfaces such as mould and decomposition. For this reason, the fixed surfaces I make exist in contrast with the impermanence of organic degeneration. Um, to investigate the digital side of my work, forms are generatively sculpted on the computer and materialised by 3D printing. So where these things have only previously existed as virtual objects, uh, they now exist on two levels, uh, as time-based phenomena, so code that exists digitally, and as physical items. The aim was to manifest physical pixels and in order to represent the simulation of digital technology and concerns the degenerate use of high technology to produce low-tech generative forms. Um, to quote John Tiffin from Hyperreality Paradigm for the Third Millennium, Hyperreality is an inability of consciousness to distinguish reality from a simulation, especially in technologically advanced postmodern societies. It is a condition of which in, it's a condition in which what is real and what is, what is fiction are blended together so there's no clear distinction between where one ends and the other begins. This is typified in the Matrix movie, if you have seen it, um, and is directly related to the philosopher Descartes' conundrum theory of reality. So hyperreality allows the commingling of physical reality with virtual reality. This postmodern concept was uh, contentiously coined by Jean Baudrillard in Simulacra and Simulation. Baudrillard defined hyperreality as the generation by models of a real without origin or reality. So in this way, um, my work aims to unite digital and analog by creating hyperreal objects that bridge these two worlds. And um, this is an image of some of my slip cast tiles uh, are used two forms which tessellate, which I rotate so they can tessellate to make these patterns which kind of create interesting shadows. Um, these were the first pieces I made 
in sort of uh, interpreting the visual nature of this subject. So these are not digital renderings, but uh, photos of my ceramic work, and therefore permanent forms immortalized from centuries of decayed matter. It's because of this I find ceramic has an interesting relationship with what is permanent and impermanent as it begins life organically, and without firing it would just continue to, to decay. Uh, and firing obviously makes it immortal. So my work attempts to address these ideas of binary existence, making virtual objects which exist tempor temporally as code into permanent physical forms. An interesting aspect of this work for me is how people view, view these physical things as digital objects. Um, it's uh, like the ideas of high res and low resolution images are so ingrained in our psyche from daily use of the computer and sending emails and images. Um, as a maker, I enjoyed the challenge in physically creating, especially its own ceramics. It's arguably the most malleable um, of materials to make with, so it can be made into anything. Um, and I enjoy these photographs as bringing my work full cycle because they sort of depict a virtual scene in physical reality. These are more of my tiles, uh, again designed on the computer and printed to uh, tessellate the positive and negative geometry which creates the shadows, excuse me, an optical illusion alludes back to the initial concept of generation versus degeneration and also digital versus analog. So going back to my inspiration, visually I'm drawn to decay as an aesthetic and I find and similarly to Paul, I guess, the, the, crumb, the crumbling and decrepit, fascinating. Uh, it speaks to me of life and death, uh, which is an infinite sort of cycle of cross-cultural and historical interest. Um, I think we all look to find meaning in life and our individual stories are sort of very similar, but not necessarily mutually exclusive. Um, my visual research often involves macro photography of surfaces I find interesting or inspiring. So this photo shows uh, two of my photos and two of my glaze test surfaces. Um, these sort of permanent surfaces that are mimicking these sort of ever changing, sort of decaying and crumbling surfaces. I try to use macro photography to zoom in to a point which is just beyond um, our normal viewpoint. So alongside my digital work I, at university, I was very interested in glaze. Um, I used a systematical approach of testing, but was also very experimental. So I'd layer glazes up and record them, and then sort of switch them around uh, to see if I could uh, replicate the, uh, the effects I uh, was told. Once is fluke and twice is technique. So. Um, this slide shows another stream of my work where I was layering up multiple glazes, but it was very difficult to replicate. So there's a bottle, a glaze bottle on the left and a picture of mouldy porcelain on the right. I find the digital techniques that I've developed are contrasting yet sympathetic to my glaze testing. Uh, I enjoyed the unpredictable as much as designing on the computer and getting almost exactly what you see on the screen. Despite this, it's a really strange thing to spend a couple of months working on a model on the computer and then finally holding it. It's, it's a bit weird for me. Um, so this is my degree show design that I mocked up on the computer. And this is the execution. The, um, it's 1.2 meters by half a meter high. And the white vessels are bone china, the black are a black stained porcelain with the tiles and a, a bit of gold, because, you know, gold's nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, this was another display that I had at my first show, um, just bringing some new forms for sort of sake of commerciality, so I made the bottles to go with it. Um, the, the physical virtual Descartes theme is much like the film Truman Show, if you've seen it which is a story of a man who lived in a world he believed to, re to be real and later finds out it's entirely a simulation. 
So I like to feel my work seeks to emulate this illusion and sort of capture the essence of a divided or binary reality, uh, which is a very sort of current theme in modern quantum physics um, with the holographic universe theory. Uh, I don't think there's any sound, which is annoying, but basically my, I also use video to do research. It's a field that I used to work in and find very, very effective for communicating ideas. So these, the two clips, very short from uh, a research trip to Wales, but I don't think it's gonna be as good. So as you can probably see a bit better from these reduced scale uh, screenshots, even though they're heavily abstracted, you can kind of make sense of kind of the scenes um, and maybe relate them to some sort of personal experience. How's it doing? Okay, no. <laughs> so, um, as modern humans, we all know we're made of genetic code and that computers create virtual realities from similar bits or bytes of code. And mankind has created a new digital world for itself from, from games to the internet. We can share information uh, with speeds unimaginable to our predecessors and you know, could speed up our evolutionary curve even faster than it has been going. And on a personal level, I find this all endlessly fascinating, an attempt to weave my own version of this infinite story into my work, and it, it gives me a, a great source of inspiration and enjoyment to try and simplify some of these complicated themes into a single polarity, um, or if you will, binary concept. I find it challenging, uh, but personally gratifying and plenty to think about. So the ideas of physical and digital degeneration led me to computer generative work and then physically manifesting objects that exist as data. Ultimately the intention is to create a digital analog fusion that tests um, notions of what is real and what is not. And that brings me to the present day where I basically remade nearly everything that I made at university to a much higher level. Um, I've had professional sort of studio photography taken, so I've got some nice crisp images, which people still don't believe are real objects, so I have this constant debate with them, but I wouldn't go through this you know, pain in the ass process. It'd be a lot easier just to make a render. Um, so if you're interested in seeing more of my work, it's on ceramics with an X which was stupid because it's very hard to tell people that over the phone and, uh, <laughs> and Instagram is ceramics.x um, oh yeah and that's my that's a new piece I made uh, post uni all my work comes out of a uh, single mould so uh, two, two, two piece mould traditionally this would have been made by with a separate bottom and separate handles and you would stick them all on later. But I was just trying to be clever. And uh, it took me four goes to make that one and I had five attempts to make it out of bone china and broke every single one. So there are limitations to how you know, clever you can be. And um, most of these objects have to, because they walk quite a lot in the kiln, they have to have sort of complicated setters made so you have double supports that shrink with the firing, otherwise you um, end up with things like that. that as it gets molten, it tends to sort of, all the way to vitrification, it warps basically, which is also painful. Mm -hmm. And that's it.
a year, I probably should have worked a bit harder on my presentation and <laughs> <laughs> explained a bit more that um, I sort of chose very archetypal forms because the, uh, the ceramic vessel is an archetype of civilization, so it's a marker an entry point of when we allegedly became civilized. So I was sort of looking to make a new marker of the sort of digital age, if you will, so digitizing these archetypes into new forms for the information age. Um, but interestingly enough, when the, so when the sun goes down, they, all the details fade and you get these blurry outlines of probably the most boring worlds you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> um, but it's interesting, I think, for all of us to have work that keeps unfolding in that way. Um, you know, to keep yourself interested. <laughs> so yeah, it was, and the same with the Witchwood inspired one. It was, uh, you know, it's a, typically that would be a very um, specialist thing to make, especially with the, you know, the very tiny base, even though they put a video of how they do it with black like, on shelves to support it, uh, that would have been very difficult for the ordinary person to achieve in ceramics. So yeah, I'm kind of taking the piss a bit, and, <laughs> a bit in my way, sort of sat, like, satire ceramic. Yeah. Um, <coughs> the, the, the digital aspect of your um, um, I find that digital helps to achieve a replication of the analog um, photographically and, and in other ways than audibly, etc. Um, and yet, I have a grandson who, who plays with Pokemon, it's all kind of blocks, things like that. Um, I think. In the future, is it going to get better? Is it going to be more smoother, or is it? Um, how is your digitalization, or physical digitalization, going to evolve? Is that going to get smoother and higher resolution? Or I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I've done what I've recently. I'd like to again. I'm sorry. I should have made it longer presentation like these guys did, but my uh, more recent sort of, like, sort of going into the verges of almost possible and impossible forms and they tend to get less smooth and a bit more sort of corrupted, um, a bit more difficult to make. But the technology is moving so fast, I mean I didn't know what 3D printing was four years ago and something that could take 70 hours to print a model at university uh, takes me 20 hours now. On the more modern machines, so you know, there was an interesting video very quickly of a little kid, one and two, two years old, in a pram, swiping through his iPad, and if you've seen it, zooming the pictures, you know, so you're on an iPad, scanning pictures and swiping pages, and then his parents gave him a Marie Claire, some big magazine, he was trying to swipe yeah. <laughs> images in the magazine. So yeah. who knows what you know when your grandson is twenty, what will happen. Can I jump in actually as well? Because I have like a personal interest in like video gaming and I totally get what you're saying. So just moving it along so quickly, so quickly. But I think there'll always be people making more analogs the wrong word, but there's always going to be a market for hyper-realism and, you know, chunky graphics. They'll always be there, I think. And they can, I think they can always run parallel without interfering with each other. We didn't have video games. <laughs> Okay, so when Brian and the students first started, we took over three seafront arches, and one of them, we had to have the ceramics because they, they kept us warm, you know, because they were you know. And I just wondered, you know, if now, you know, I don't know, space, time, money, whatever, would you still need all that, all that technology when you think about 3D printing? And whether in fact you do need all this stuff. But then again, I watch television and I see that the ceramics is really, <laughs> it's like cooking, you know. So I, I, don't, I don't know what you feel about this, but. Yeah. I don't know, one day maybe you can pop an entire ceramic sculpture out of a computer that's you know, six foot high, fire it, and you don't have to have any, any knowledge apart from the computer knowledge and that we're not there yet. Um, so do you really want to get to that point anyway? No, I'm glad. Personally, you know, I, I don't. That's why I use, you know, and you do. You want to use that, then sort of like hand building, slip casting, 
yeah. you know, when you're actually, in, you know, you still end up fettling your pots and yeah. you know, your pieces and cleaning them up, you know, it's not a... That's very you know, yeah, I, I personally really want to stay awake, and I love using digital as a tool, but, you know, there are, there, there, there are printers that you can print clay, you know, wonderful, amazing things that you just can't, you couldn't probably physically build, but... Yeah, but I would like to say that when, again, even with printing, anything on the horizontal undercut like this, you can't print bottoms because you can't print plastic into thin air, so you print support. Mm -hmm. The same as in a clay printer, you can do this sort of stuff, but you can't print support, so you're limited to certain angles and things like this, so there's yeah. quite a lot you can do, and there are people that explicitly use ceramic printers, but again, it's just another tool to do something mm -hmm. else, but yeah. we all make we all hand make. I think it's quite in the zeitgeist at the moment as well, quite lucky because people are going back to that one day and people want to have like a month in there that pots <coughs> is actually sleeved. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and I think that's all the term digital craft is, you know, it's, it's interesting but there's too much, uh, there's a lot being talked about at the moment. Any, any, well, I want to know about what, what's life like at Phoenix. <laughs> <laughs> actually, you know, when these guys apply to us, which was year, two years ago, uh, we're coming up to a year. Uh, we've just yes, yeah. 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 All right. But we, we, we were. It was empty for six months, or yes, yeah. maybe not. Maybe four because we were still finishing. Yeah. yeah. So they were. They just um, done their MA. They applied to our process, and I had these beautifully written four <coughs> applications from this ceramic collective. And it just so happened we had a very big studio downstairs available. So they got through the application process. Then I rang Alice up and she said, you've got a studio. And it was like, there's never been anyone who's more excited. Do you remember me running into that? I was like, I was breathless, absolutely breathless. Because I was walking, I don't know, I was out and about, and I ran back to uni. I was like, oh, guys, guys, you've got a studio. Yeah. So, well, 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 you've got that. No, you, you've got something to do. Yeah. You've got something it's very, it's really important to us because we have a lot of equipment, we have a lot of wood, we have a lot of you know buckets and everything basically, mm. you know, shitloads of stuff. It was like moving house. Yeah. And mm. if you didn't have a studio to go to, then you know, what do you what do you do with stuff? And you know, do not saying on oh, is easy, but in terms of space you probably could work fairly easily on your kitchen table, per se, but ceramics needs very specialist equipment. Um, in answer to your question, Phoenix is cold from just yeah, about the collective, just tell us uh, if you've all talked about your individual work, is there anything more to the collective beyond just sharing the studio? I think we've all got to say as if I tried to sort of it's really difficult to speak to those people who get nervous and it's you kind of feel like you're going, but I was trying to say that we all we all work in ceramics, but there's no conflict of interest because even though there are similarities between what some of us do, we all have different skills. Mm -hmm. And it's really nice to be able to, we all have the same training, but we do different things. Uh, and we, we remember different things, so we kind of support each other, help each other with techniques, even things that I've, we've forgotten along the way, mm -hmm. someone else might need. Um, so it's great to be, because once you're out of uni, there's no support. Like. And it's a network as well, a tiny little network of yeah. people, but it's great to be there with somebody else because I think I pre uni you hear a lot of I don't know always like horror stories of like of these isolated artists and that was always the advice that I got but before leaving uni that just just have a community, you need a community <coughs> around you or you get stilted, you know, you're stuck in you make the same work for ten years and you just mm. wither away. <laughs> 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 so to follow up from that, so what's the dynamic like in the, in the space between the four and the four of Four of us, I think there's only been two occasions with the four of us at the end of the same time. Um, I'd see Emma a lot, um, and then I see Alice sometimes, all, but we never have more than two people in it. Mm. Which is what's actually quite helpful, yeah. 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 <laughs> Especially trying to do faster and play. Well, I've had it. If we were all in it, it would have been a bit, a bit too much. No, 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 it'd be fine. We just sort of, strangely, we just all work at very sort of different 
And because we do different work here, there's no, we're not trying to. It's difficult, isn't it? Because if you don't sell work, you don't get the money to make more work, which is the, you know, the sort of building blocks of this thing. We're not competing with each other in what we do, which is probably really good. Quite um, yeah, so we're all aiming at different places. There's a question here. Um, when you guys aren't in the studio, do you guys have part-time jobs or do you fall through a studio as well for your own practice or do you? I think everybody does something. Yeah, we all do something. I, I help a friend make furniture, so I work with him two, two three days a week, which is handy because he has a great workshop, so I can make it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's in Brighton. I think most people do something else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even when you, because the thing is, when you go to university, there's a, they were saying, oh, it's very hard to make a living now doing blah, blah, blah. And you think, fuck am I here for? <laughs> um, and then when you speak to people who are professionals, you know, some people are better, I don't know, it's luck or however it was, but most people, a lot, of, a lot of people teach or they do other things, I would say, I don't know. I've been told the transition can be 10 years long. So year one, you're working full time, year 10, you're full time. So it's, no, I don't know if that's true. If anybody can help me. Team of them. I work for two other ceramicists, so I kind of do what, for them, what I hope to be doing in like five years or something. So they get big orders and then I make things for them. But also very surprising, right? Um, Brighton and Portslade. Uh, and I work in a PR company um, in Hove, but we work with designer makers, so it's all quite industry relevant. Quite useful. It's very useful, yeah, yeah, yeah. very useful. Dark arts, it's the flip side, honestly. <laughs> oh, the things, the things you see. <laughs> fascinated to hear about the different disciplines that, that, that unite you here at Phoenix. Um, so um, don't go away, have a drink at the bar and just let's give them a round of applause.